Welcome to the Creative Thinking Podcast with Kim Thomas, a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. In each episode, we seek to inspire, inform, and encourage creative thinking from a biblical perspective. Through this Advent season, Kim will share readings, prayers, poems, and ponderances, reminding us of the depth and beauty of Christ's incarnation. Find a link in the show notes to download the accompanying PDF devotional. Also, if you live in the Middle Tennessee area, we welcome you to join us in our historic chapel for our candlelight Christmas Eve services at 4 and 5.30 p.m. or streaming online at 5 p.m. Now, here's Kim. Known as the Prince of Preachers. Charles Haddon Spurgeon's influence in the 19th century was enormous, and the influence continues today in our own time. He is the source for our classic devotional today on creative thinking. This Victorian Calvinistic Baptist minister began his itinerant preaching at the young age of 17 out of Cambridge, England. And It was in London at 1854, at the age of 20, where he began his long-term work at what would become the Metropolitan Tabernacle. The dwindling congregation at the time, in a rough part of London, could not even pay him a living wage. But it grew exponentially in a short three months, and it continued to multiply and multiply until at one point, after they built the new sanctuary, it grew to 5,000 in the congregation. Those next 38 years of his life, God would use Spurgeon's voice far and wide as his gospel invitation, so much so that through his life, Spurgeon would share the gospel with over a million people, and he would personally have the privilege of baptizing 15,000 new believers. He had a gift of communication and creatively navigated the rich theology and voice of the people combination that brought so many to listen. He was quoted as saying that God called him to feed his sheep, not his giraffes. So, he said, we must not put the fodder on a high rack by our fine language, but use great plainness of speech. Likely inspired by John Bunyan as a young man, you can see how that worked its way into his speech. He creatively preached Jesus Christ and him crucified to the masses, and by God's great design and grace, They responded. The rest of Spurgeon's CV would show him founding a college, a seminary, two orphanages, ministries to prostitutes, police, widows, abused women, over 66 parachurch ministries, as well as being responsible for over 200 church plants. And his many sermons and books were translated into over 40 languages and his books are still actively published today. C.H. Spurgeon served at the Metropolitan Tabernacle for 38 years until his death in 1892 at the young age of 58. All that in those short years. And at 58, he came face to face with the Jesus he so loved and shared so generously. His productive life was, he said, all of grace. So our reading today is from one of his Advent classics, perfect for our theme this week. It is our turn to welcome Christ in this Advent season, and so today's reading is called Emmanuel, God with us. In addition to explaining the name of Jesus and recording its God-given origin, the Holy Spirit, by the evangelist Matthew, has been pleased to refer us to the synonym of it, 
and so to give us still more of its meaning. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. If, when our Lord was born and named Jesus, the old prophecy which said that he should be called Emmanuel was fulfilled, it follows that the name Jesus bears a signification tantamount to that of Emmanuel, and that its virtual meaning is God with us. And indeed, he is Jesus, the Savior, because he is Emmanuel, God with us. And as soon as he was born, and so became Emmanuel, the incarnate God, he became by that very act Jesus, the Savior. By coming down from heaven to this earth and taking upon himself our nature, he bridged the otherwise bridgeless gulf between God and man. By suffering in that human nature and imparting through his divine nature an infinite efficacy to his suffering, he removed that which would have destroyed us and instead brought us everlasting life and salvation. O Jesus, dearest of all names in earth or in heaven, I love thy music all the better, because it is in such sweet harmony with another name which rings melodiously in mine ears, Emmanuel, God with us. Our Savior is God, and therefore he is mighty to save. He is God with us. He is divine and therefore infinitely wise. But he is human and therefore full of compassion. Never let us for a moment hesitate as to the Godhead of our Lord Jesus Christ, for his deity is a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. It may be that we shall never fully understand how God and man could be united in one person, for who by searching can find out God? These great mysteries of godliness, these deep things of God, are beyond our measurement. Our little skiff might be lost if we ventured out so far upon the vast, infinite ocean as to lose sight of the shore of plainly revealed truth. Isn't this wonderful the way he explains that it's okay that we don't know everything, but we know some things. But let it remain as a matter of faith that Jesus Christ, even he who lay in Bethlehem's manger and was carried in a woman's arms and lived a suffering life and died on a malefactor's cross, was nevertheless the appointed heir of all things the brightness of his Father's glory and the express image of his person, who thought it not a prize to be grasped to be equal with God. For that honor was already his, so that he could truly say, I and my Father are one. If it were not so, not only would the great strength of our hope be gone, but the glory of the Incarnation would have evaporated altogether. The very essence of it is that it was God himself who was veiled in human flesh. If it was any other being who thus came to us, I see nothing very remarkable in it, nothing comforting. But God with us, is the source of exquisite delight. God with us. All that God means, the deity, the infinite Jehovah with us. This, this is the worthy of the burst of midnight song when angels startled the shepherds with their carols, singing glory to God in the highest 
and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This was worthy of the foresight of seers and prophets, worthy of a new star in the heavens, worthy of the care which inspiration has manifested to preserve the record. He's speaking of the scriptures there. He who was born at Bethlehem is God and God with us. God, there lies the majesty. God with us, there lies the mercy. God, therein is glory. God with us, therein is grace. God alone might well strike us with terror, but God with us inspires us with hope and confidence. Emmanuel, God with us. My, my, how beautifully Spurgeon expresses the paradox of the deity and human humanity of Christ, the majesty and mercy, the glory and grace. I hope you've been inspired by these words of a man from many, many years ago. Some accompanying scriptures for us to read today. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, in Christ Jesus, God with us, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And Spurgeon explains that in one of those paragraphs that we read. Then Colossians 2, verse 9, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So that's that paradox, that mix, that he is fully God and fully man. The two, from both of those two passages, we see that. And John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And as Spurgeon said, there lies the majesty. Today, our prayer focus is the health of families. And we've prayed for the physical and emotional health of our families these last two weeks. So today, let's pray for the spiritual health of our families, having been inspired uh, by Spurgeon today and by this beautiful reading, keeping in mind the welcome of Christ this week. All right, if you'll bow your heads, we will pray together. We are grateful, Lord, to share the good news of Emmanuel with our families this Advent season. There's nothing more meaningful than to have a shared spiritual life together and to know the love of Christ together. We pray for ongoing spiritual hunger and thirst for you in the midst of so many distractions, desires, and longings. Lord, may our children spouses, siblings, and extended families hunger and thirst for a deeper walk with you. May the understanding of the word increase and their appetite for the things of great substance grow. We ask you to surround our families with spiritual leaders and good influences, protect them in their friendships and the leaders who have that influence over their lives in schools or offices. May their mentorship be godly, and may it fan the flames of godliness in our loved ones. And Father, we pray with Paul that the work you begin in our families, you will continue to complete until the day you return for that second advent, when we will welcome you yet again. For this day and these things, we ask in your mighty name. Amen. Thanks for listening today. 
take a moment to leave a review and share this episode with friends and family. You can stay connected to The Village Chapel by signing up for our newsletter or following us on social media. For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com.